this is not raining like it was last week. Last week was pouring, so now we've got the sweltering heat. So you guys are being tested. Faithful few. <laughs> so just welcome to any new visitors for the first time. Just make yourself at home. It's nice to see you all. Um, yeah, and it's going to be, it's really exciting just to see, you know, if we can change one person, just one life has changed, that's what counts. And so see all these, these children standing here and see these children who are going to grow up serving the Lord, loving the Lord, fulfilling what God's called them to do. I mean, that is the most exciting thing, hey. You know, that, as I shared last week, they've all got a plan and purpose and God's going to use some of them. They don't know it yet in ways that are beyond their imagination. And so God is good. He's got a plan that he wants to fulfill. And so uh, we started, uh, last year we started a journey on Bible prophecy. And we started working through um, Bible prophecy. And so we took a bit of a, a stop towards, I think, December, November, December. We started doing Christmas and a few other things. And I thought what I'll do is I'll start that prophetic series again and just continue to go through the Bible. And it really is a, a, it's a journey that takes us from, as we said, from the beginning of creation it takes us through the Old Testament, the New Testament. It takes us through how God dealt with man, how man worked with God. And then it takes us to the time that, and the things that haven't come into being yet and things that haven't happened. And so I thought we'll carry on that, with that um, this morning. I just got the first slide that I just wanted to put up there. And that is, so we started, for those that weren't here, we started on your top right. We just had a look at the fact that God created the angelic beings. And after he created the angelic beings, God created the earth. And the angels were there when God created the earth. And they celebrated and they gave glory to God because he was the one who created the earth. Then we saw there was a personality or, or, or an angelic being called Lucifer. And he was beautiful. And he, the Bible says he was perfect in wisdom and perfect in beauty. And we see that he was the one, because of his beauty, he rebelled against God. He became full of pride and he fell. And he became our greatest enemy. So he is now, we call, call him our spiritual enemy. We can call him the devil, Satan. So he's the one who fell. And he was the one who caused the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. And because he's very cunning and because he's very devious, he takes a word of God sometimes and he uses a word in a not so accurate way and can deceive. And so that's what he did in the Garden of Eden. He deceived Adam and Eve into disobeying God, eating the, the fruit um, and so we had the fall of man. It wasn't long after that that we saw God, God came to the God and God gave the first prophecy ever recorded in the Bible. And God said that her seed will bruise your head. And so God promised that one day there's going to be a savior that's going to come into the world to set things right. Then we saw we had the great flood. And the flood was, came, as we know, because God needed to cleanse the earth and, and, and save the bloodline of man. Then we saw we went to the Tower of Babel. And we saw that there was a man called Nimrod, and he created the Tower of Babel, and he started Babylon, basically, and it started out of rebellion, it started out of defiance to God. And so anything related to the Tower of Babel and Babylon really was out of rebellion to God and what God had to do. And it was man saying, I'm going to do it my way, not God's way. Then we saw God uh, made a promise to a man called Abraham. And he said to Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation. And we saw that God went into a blood covenant with this man called Abraham. And it's through the blood covenant that God made a way that Jesus could be born. And so Jesus could also shed his blood for you and me and for our sins. And so that was very powerful. Then we saw the fall of Israel. And so um, Israel was a chosen race. God was going to use the nation of Israel to reach the world and just to show the way to this great Messiah. But because of their rebellion the idolatry and those sort of things, you know, um, unfortunately God didn't use him. And so we saw the fall of the nation of Israel and we said that they were attacked by the Babylonian Empire and they were scattered. And so this morning what I thought I'd do is I'll start on the four world empires. And I, you know, I think I've told you before that um, I love the book of Daniel. But the book of Daniel is an incredible book because what it does, God actually gives this gentleman or this man, Daniel, he shows him the future and he shows him the four world empires that are going to come into the world. He shows him that there's going to be a period after the four world empires of a kingdom that's still yet to come and that'll be ruled by a certain person. And at the same time, he actually showed Jesus returning to the earth to defeat this antichrist. And he showed this all to this man, Daniel, in dreams. 
And so it's quite a lot of information, and I apologize, and I've tried to make it as interesting as I can. But I thought we'll go through the dream that um, God gave Nebuchadnezzar and just have a look at how God foretold the different empires, world empires that come in place. And what's interesting is you'll see that where in the dream God shows certain things happening, it aligns in time frames when Jesus is coming back. And so it doesn't give us a date or a time, but it, it gives us an error that when this happens, Jesus will return. And so God gave this man incredible wisdom and incredible insight. And so I think I've shared with you before Daniel. Daniel was from the tribe of Judah. He was a young man when he was taken captive to Babylon. They changed his name. Um, and in a short time, he rose to a really high position. And Daniel had a lot of, he held a lot of positions in different areas. And so he was actually a prime minister of two of those world empires. And so that's an incredible miracle that here's a slave from, you know, Jerusalem. And God used him in the Babylonian Empire. And God used him in the Medes and Persian Empire, basically, as the number two in the country. Um, some facts about Daniel we shared before. So he's one of the few where in the Bible you can't find much negative about Daniel. He's a spotless character. You know, there's no negativity. He didn't, there's nothing about things he did wrong. Um, he's a man greatly beloved by God. And I believe that's one of the reasons God used him and showed him so much of things to come. You know, he associated with kings and politicians. He rose into very powerful positions. And yet... There was never anything that could be said about him or against him to tarnish his reputation. And so that is in itself is a miracle. And it was while Daniel was serving under King Nebuchadnezzar that the God gave Nebuchadnezzar a dream. And so we'll go through the dream. And then a little bit later you'll see God gave basically a similar dream to Daniel. And the dream, the way God sees is so different. So when Nebuchadnezzar had the dream, you'll see just now, he sees these empires as glorious and wonderful and all these special metals. When God gives Daniel the dream, God sees him as ferocious beasts and just wanting to war and to kill. And so God often sees things very differently to the way you and I would see it. We might see it as, oh, this is something glorious or wonderful, but God goes and actually sees the nature and what's really interesting as, you look, as we look at it, you can actually, the way God describes it, you can actually see the nature of that kingdom. And we'll go through that. So that's really interesting. So I'll read to you King Nebuchadnezzar's dream. So this is Daniel 2, 31 to 35. So this is Daniel. So Daniel's now telling the king. He says, Oh, you saw, O king, behold you a great image. This image was mighty and of exceeding brightness. It stood before you and its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was fine gold and the chest and the arms of silver. The middle and the thighs were of bronze. Its legs were of iron. Its feet were of partly of iron and partly of clay. As you looked at the statue, obviously, a stone was cut out by no human hand. And it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them into pieces. Then the iron and the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold, all together were broken into pieces. And they became like chaff in the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, so there was no trace could be found of them. And then it says, but the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And that's probably a great place to say, Lord, just open our heart to receive, help us to understand, and Lord, just help us to Talk through this clearly, Father God, that it's easy to understand and clear. And so we thank you for that, Jesus. And so that's quite a mouthful. So you read that and you think, gee, there's a lot of information. And so if you look at the, the next slide, what I'll do is I'll just go through the different, um, what do you call it, the different materials or minerals that, that he saw in his dream. So the first thing that he saw, he said he saw a head of gold. And so the head of gold in, was something that's already taken place that's referring to the Babylonian Empire and it was specific to Nebuchadnezzar so that head of gold in the Bible it tells us that Nebuchadnezzar was that head of gold and it's interesting because the head of gold was um, you know the, it didn't last for a long time it only lasted for 66 years the Babylonian Empire but it was one of the most glorious and full of splendor world empires that ever existed and so I'll just read some stuff to you and I, 
I was going to get teens to read it, but I'll just read it to you. So just to give you an idea of what, what the city was like. So the city of Babylon was built in the exact square of 24 kilometers on each side. So it was 96 kilometers. It had a wall around it. The wall was 26 meters thick. And according to some ancient um, Greek historians, it was 106 meters high. And so this wall went around the whole city. On the walls were 250 towers, and on top of the wall, it was wide enough to have four to six chariots racing along the width of the wall. Outside the wall was a vast ditch or a moat which surrounded the city, and it was kept full from the river Euphrates. And you had to get into the city through drawbridges, and that's why it was so hard to penetrate or defeat, because you couldn't get to the city except over the drawbridge. There were eight gates into the city. Within the city, there were 53 temples and 180 altars to the god Ishtar. It had a number of palaces. The palaces were interconnected by subterranean passages or passages that went under the moats and under the water to connect all these different um, palaces and all these amazing um, dining rooms. And we, we read in one of the Bible at one stage, it had a thousand people around the table. So you're talking excessive. So it was a, it was a very um, splendorful place. It says, near one of these palaces stood the Tower of Bell um, with an outside stairway going to the stomach. And the chapel was on top of it at 201 meters high. The chapel contained the most expensive furniture of any place of worship in the world. The golden image, which was 45 feet high, was worth $17.5 million. And all the utensils were worth $200 million. And so you're talking a city that was just built, that was splendorsome. Babylon also contained one of the seven wonders of the world, the most famous hanging gardens. And a, there's a little bit of a picture there on the bottom right of what it looks like. These gardens were 400 feet square, and they were raised in different terraces above each other. And from a distance, it looks like it was a forest-covered mountain. And this is remarkable given this was in the plain of the Euphrates. And so this garden was built by Nebuchadnezzar for his wife. Because um, she was married. She came from the, the king of um, the Medes. And so he tried to, as we all do, make sure his wife was happy and felt at home. So he built a garden. I haven't gone to that extent yet. But I'm working with teens on some smaller stuff first. And then we'll get to the bigger stuff. Um, and then it says here, never before or since has the earth seen a, a, a prophetic nation like this. And Isaiah 13 verse 19, it says, Babylon, the glory of kingdoms and the beauty of the Chaldees. And so God used this man. And, you know, when we look at the book of Daniel, there's so much information just in that. But that was the first kingdom, world empire that, that Daniel saw. Then we see, we go to the next one, and it's the arms and the chest of silver. And this is something that's also taken place in history. It refers to the Medes and Persian Empire. And it's really interesting, you know, the Bible, Dad and I talk about it a lot, the Bible's so intertwined. If you just study and look, the Bible will say something in a, in a part that you don't know, and it ties into something else. And so, in the book of Daniel, verse, chapter 5, verse 30 and 31, it actually says, in that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans. So this is now the Babylonian king of the time. It says, um, in that night was Belshazzar slain, and Darius the Median took the kingdom. And so the Babylonian empire was overthrown by the Medes and the Persians, which God had already foresaw. And so there's a gentleman called Darius. He was a Mede. He came in, and what they did apparently is they, they couldn't get into the they couldn't get into the Babylonian city. And so what they did is they, they um, what's the right word? Rerouted the river Euphrates. And so they could actually go through on dry ground. And that's how they eventually managed to get, it, get in and defeat the Babylonian city. So it was pretty incredible. Um, so Darius, he defeated um, Nebuchadnezzar. And then later, so Darius was the uncle, and after that, his younger nephew, a guy called Cyrus, came in. And so that's why it's called the Medes and the Persian Empire, because the uncle defeated it together with Cyrus. And eventually, Cyrus was ruling. And um, 
it's interesting how God uses different people in different kingdoms to do what he needs to get done. And so God prophesied, actually, that I'll see you some scriptures now. God prophesied about 175 to 200 years before Cyrus actually came and defeated Babylon. God already prophesied and told him that this was going to happen. And so Isaiah 44, verses 28, it says, That saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd. Now this is the Lord speaking. He is my shepherd, and he will perform all my pleasure. Even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built... And to the temple, thy foundations shall be laid. And so what God did, as we'll see just now, God actually used this man, Cyrus, to allow the Jews to go back and rebuild the temple. And in Isaiah 45, verses 1 to 5, the Lord's still speaking. It says, Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue the nations before him and to loose the armor of kings. And so God used him to defeat King Nebuchadnezzar, to open up before him, that Cyrus, the doors. Um, and those, those doors are the doors that were under Babylon. So he actually got into the city. So the gates will not be shut. Then verse um, says, I will go before you that you may know that I am the Lord. I have called you by name. I am the God of Israel. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and for Israel, my elect, I have even called you by your name. And then look at what it says. I have named you, though you have not known me. And so God actually called this man and used him, even though he didn't necessarily serve the Lord or know the Lord. And so God used this guy Cyrus to do two main things. The first thing is he, he used him to besiege and to take over Babylon. And the second thing he did is he, like I said, he actually used him to let the Jews go and build the temple again. And there's another incredible scripture. So God's already told you in the beginning that he's going to let Cyrus go and, you know, let the Jews go and build a temple. And if you go to Ezra, verse 1, verses 1 to 3, it says, In the first years of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved on the heart of Cyrus, the king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout the land. So this is now what Cyrus, who's now you know, heading up the Second World Empire. This is what he declares. He says, This is what Cyrus, the king of Persia, says, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and has appointed me to build a temple for him in Jerusalem, in Judea. Any of his people among you may go up to Jerusalem, into Judea, and to build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem, and they may, and may their God be with him. And so it's incredible how God foretold this before it happened and it all came to pass. And the Medes and Persian Empire only lasted about 208 years and then the next empire came into being and that was the belly and the thighs of bronze. And so this is something that's also taken place in history and the belly and the thighs of bronze actually refers to the Grecian Empire. And this is a world empire. It was only in existence for a very short while under Alexander the Great. Um, and the thing with Alexander the Great is he, he didn't have a huge army. He had a small army. They were well trained. They were equipped. They were very good. And so within 10 years, he basically defeated the, the Persians and everyone else. And he, he became the third world empire. It's interesting you see, so the way Nebuchadnezzar was the head of gold. And then you saw the Medes and the Persian, they were of silver. So silver is less splendorful and less important and less glorious than gold. And so as, as we go through the statue you'll see the material actually gets less in value or less in importance. And that's what happened with the world empires. God, you know, the Babylonian empire was splendorful, and then Medes and Persians was less so, and then we get down to bronze, so it's, you know, the Grecian empire was less impressive. And so it's interesting that God, through this dream, through the statue, portrayed the nature and the, I suppose, the operation of a lot of these ki kingdoms, which is, I think is incredible. And so brass was inferior to, to silver. Um, and then the Grecian Empire didn't last very long. It only lasted for about 185 years. And then there was a story. I, I wasn't sure if I should read it or not. But I won't read the story. But um, Josephus, who is a historian, he's, he's recorded something where, and I'll just try and 
decipher slash read, explain what it is. So he said that um, when Alexander the Great, so he defeated, he was defeating all these different places. So he came to Jerusalem. And normally what he'd do is he'd come into a place and he'd wipe the people out and he'd take over. And so what happened is God gave Alexander a dream, but God also gave the high priest a dream. And in the, in the dream, the high priest actually saw that he should wear certain robes. So he should wear certain robes and they should go out and greet Alexander the Great with all his priests and everyone. And I'll try and read a little bit of it. And it just says, um, the priest had a warning from God in a dream and he saw himself in a purple road, robe. And he had obviously, he had that fancy hat on with the name God engraved on it. What they did is they went to meet Alexander the Great, followed by all the priests that were all clothed in fine linen and multitude of citizens, and they were waiting for the so were they were waiting for Alexander when he arrived now to welcome him. Um, when Alexander arrived, you know, he saw the high priest, he reverenced God, and he saluted the high priest. And so they actually they didn't have to kill anyone, they just took over without a battle. And apparently his general said to him, his general was surprised because obviously Alexander was someone who defeats, he kills. And so his general was surprised and said, why are you just, you know, why are you honoring this high priest? And um, what's written down here, it says, Alexander replied, I did not honor him, but God who has honored him, um, I saw this very person in a dream. So obviously God had given a dream. I saw this person in a dream uh, and, and basically just said, you know, I was wondering how I'd take over it. Um, and he said, yeah, he promised that he would conduct my army and give me the dominion over the Persians. And so it's incredible that God, you know, tells so much information. There's so much in history. And so that was the Grecian Empire. Alexander the Great was an amazing man. He defeated the world by 28. Um, and I think by 30, 32, he was, he was dead. So the next empire that came up was the Legs of Ein. And so the next empire, as you go to back in history, the next one after the Grecian Empire was the Roman Empire. And it talks about the legs of iron. So again, iron is strong, but it's not as precious as gold or silver. And interesting, the Roman Empire was the strongest and the longest lasting empire of all the world empires. It lasted more than 500 years. I think it was around 700 years that it lasted. And Rome was noted for its iron rules. So I mean, the Romans ruled... And when they were in charge of that, you knew they ruled. You know, and a lot of people, since, since the fall of the Roman Empire, there's never been another world empire that's dominated the world like Rome. And so lots have tried. I mean, we've had these ones we'll know, like the Huns have tried, Napoleon tried, you know, Hitler and Stalin, but no one succeeded after the Roman Empire to, to basically have a world empire. And a lot of people believe that towards the end of time when the Antichrist comes that there's going to be a part of the Roman Empire revived and they will be part of you know, what happens in the future. But that's speculation. You just have to wait and see if you're around. A few things about that statue which is interesting. Um, it's got the two legs and the legs take up most of the statue which is interesting. And the Roman Empire, like I said, ruled more than all the other world empires. It was the longest ruling empire. And there's two legs on the statue, and it's interesting because Rome was divided, the Roman Empire was divided into two parts. You had the Eastern Division, which was with Constantinople, and you had the Western Division, which was Rome. And so God shows a lot of information in these things. And so that's the Roman Empire that's taken place. The next thing that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream as he went through this statue, it was feet and toes of clay. And this is a kingdom that has not taken place yet. This is a kingdom that has not come into being yet. And this is going to be the final world empire before Jesus returns. And you, I'll show you in the dream how that fits together. So, so in, the, in the dream, he saw these feet and toes of clay um, and iron. Um, and we know that clay and iron don't mix. And so I try to find a picture there where you can see it's it's standing, but it's pretty fragmented and, you know, chips off, and so it's not very strong. And so what that does is that portrays that there's coming a world empire, and I mean, those of you that studied Revelations and those of you that study, you know, end times with the Antichrist, you know, there's coming a world empire that's going to have an impact on the earth, and it's going to have a, it's going to portray power, it's going to portray 
you know, we, are, we, we know what we're doing, we have this wolf empire, everything's going fine. But because it's a mixture of clay and iron, what it's doing is portraying something that is not really. And so what will happen is you'll start getting a weakness within the government, you'll start getting the government affecting each other. And, and what's interesting is there's 10 toes on that statue. Um, what they say, and this, again, we'll have to wait and see, what they say is there'll be 10 nations that form part of that last world empire that serve with the Antichrist. Of those 10, three will fall away. And so what's happening is basically God's just showing that there's going to be a world empire, but it's not going to be as strong as the Roman Empire, and it's going to have cracks in it, and it's not going to be, a, you know, it's not going to last very long. And so that's talking about the time when the Antichrist comes and rules on earth. Then the next thing that we see on the, on the statue, it talks about a stone kingdom. And it says, a stone cut out of a mountain without hands. And it says that the stone is going to come and it's going to hit the statue in the feet. And so I've got a picture there to try and show you what it is. And so the stone cut out of the mountain without hands is referring to Jesus, because it's not man-made, it's not from man. It's referring to God, referring to the Lord Jesus. And so, you know, we know Jesus is a stone. Um, Jesus uh, was to the Jew. He was a stone of stumbling. Um, he was a stone that the builders rejected. And in Genesis 49, verse 24, it actually says the shepherd, the stone of Israel. And so that, what I find is just so amazing is that in that statue, we have all the world empires that have taken place. God shows us there's this world empire that's still to come. Then he says, at the time that the feet are in place, a stone or Jesus is going to come back at that same time and he's going to come and hit the statue and defeat it. And um, that's when the Lord comes back and we know that Jesus comes back to defeat the Antichrist during, at the end of the seven-year tribulation. And so it's interesting that God has showed us so much information and I, I'm, hope, I'm struggling to get it out in a way that makes sense, but I'm hoping it makes sense that you know, when you look at the statue, the time when Jesus comes back is at the bottom where the feet are. And that's the time when the Antichrist is ruling. And so we know from Scripture, the Bible tells us in Revelation that Jesus will come back at the end of the tribulation period to defeat the Antichrist. And so that statue and that picture that Nebuchadnezzar saw is actually basically depicting what's in the book of Revelation. That when, when the Antichrist is there, he's going to set up his kingdom it's not going to be as strong as they think. There's going to be some, you know, some people won't want to join him. And during that time frame or during that period when he's on earth, Jesus will return. Now, we don't know when that is, but at the time when it happens, Jesus will return. And so I thought it's just incredible that we can see so much information in a dream. And so this is the dream that God gave Nebuchadnezzar. Then it talks about, at the end there, it says that the stone cut without hands, which is Jesus, it says... It'll come and it'll destroy. You remember what it said? I'll just read it to you again. It said here, The stone cut without human hands, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay. And so that's Jesus returning in the time of the um, Antichrist. Then it says, The iron and the clay and the bronze and the silver and the gold together were broken into pieces. They became like chafe of the summer floor. And it says the wind carried him away. And then it says, but the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the earth. And so what, what we know from Scripture and what we know from Revelations is that when Jesus comes back and he defeats the Antichrist, he's going to set up his earthly kingdom. And so that's the mountain that's going to fill the earth. And so it's incredible that we can get so much information out of uh, God's word. And so that's the dream that Nebuchadnezzar has. I'll just quickly go through the dream that Daniel had. And so like I said, Daniel had a dream, but Daniel's dream, God showed basically Daniel the empires, but he gave a different perspective on it. And so I'll just share that as well because it's quite interesting. So this is Daniel 7, 2 and 8. And what you can do is, I mean, I don't have time now, but if you wanted to read the book of Daniel and you go and read the book of Daniel, and you read the book of Revelation, you'll be able to see how you piece this all together, because the book of Revelation will tell you this, and the book of Daniel tells you where, where, he, where the um, angel explains to Daniel who these different things are. You know, and I don't have time to go into that, but it tells you all these different things of what this means and what that means. 
So Daniel has a dream, Daniel 7. So Daniel has a dream and it says, in, in my night vision I looked and before me were the four winds. And then verse 3 says, four great beasts, each of a different from each other, came out from the sea. The first was like a lion and it had the wings of an eagle. And I watched until the wings were torn off and it was lifted from the ground. So it stood on two feet like a human being. And the mind of a human was given to it. And I won't go into that, but Nebuchadnezzar went mad for seven years. He thought he was an animal. He ate grass for seven years. And after seven years, God restored him back to being it. So that's that, but um, that's just for a different story. The second beast I saw looked like a bear. It was raised up on one side, had three ribs in its mouth. And another beast I saw, verse 6, after that I looked and before me was an, another beast. It looked like a leopard. And on its back, it had four wings of a bird. This beast had four heads and it was given authority to rule. After that, in my night vision, I looked and before me there was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth, it crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from the former beasts and it had ten horns. And remember we referred around the ten horns and there were ten toes. So there's the correlation. So it had ten horns. A little horn came up from among them. Three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a human being and a mouth that spoke boastfully. And so if you just put in your mind, I didn't put a picture up, I should have. If you have the statue and you have this fourth beast, there's ten toes on the statue and there's ten horns. And remember I said the feet of clay and iron won't match. And so a lot of people believe that when the, um, Antichrist sets up his empire, he'll have ten nations from Europe. And three of those nations or kings or presidents will actually pull away from the Antichrist. And so that's why he doesn't have such a strong government. And are you, I mean, yeah, okay. It, I know it's a lot to take in. I'm sorry if it's... So the first beast... Okay, so now, now we're going down. We went through the statue just now. Now we're going through the beasts. And you just got to think in your mind, Daniel had the same dream as Nebuchadnezzar. So what we went down from the top of the statue, we're going to go down to the beasts. So the first beast that Daniel saw is something that's already taken place. It refers to the Babylonian Empire. And the first beast was the lion with eagle's wings. And it's interesting because the lion is the king of the beasts and the eagle is the king of the birds. And Nebuchadnezzar was a king. He was the head of gold. So he, was, he had that splendor and that glory when he ruled on earth. Um, and the lions and the kings, are, uh, the lions and the eagles, they're kings of their realm. And so Nebuchadnezzar was, God chose him. So he was um, that king. And the Bible actually says that, um, the Bible actually says, God actually says to him, you are the king, you are the head of gold that I've chosen. And so that's Nebuchadnezzar. And so, the second beast that he saw, so that was Nebuchadnezzar, the second beast there is the bear. And the bear refers to the Medes and the Persians. And what I, what I found interesting is the bear is, is stronger than the lion. The bear is very distinguished. It's very ferocious, but it's slower. It's just heavier. It's stronger. Um, it doesn't have the agility of the lion. It doesn't have the speed of the lion. It's just brute force with the bear. And those are characteristics of the Medes and Persian Empire. Because the Medes and Persian Empire, and I've, I've, I've got this um, from those who know. It says here, um, just doing some research, the Medes and Persians were slow, crushing army. They were well known. They simply overwhelmed their opponents with superior size and strength. One of the expeditions against Greece was undertaken with two and a half million fighting men. And with the camp, it made five million men. And so the Medes and the Persians exactly what God portrayed in the dream. They were just a brute force to be dealt with. They didn't need speed. They didn't need talent. They didn't need good skills. They just went as a mass and they just destroyed the empire before them. And that's exactly what the bear is and how the bear operates. And so I thought that was incredible that you have the nature. And with Nebuchadnezzar, you know, he represented the lion and he was the king of what he did. The third beast we see... Um, in the dream was a leopard and this has also taken place and this represents Greece and interesting the leopard for those of you who know the leopard is quick 
It's cunning. It hides. It moves fast. It's very agile. And this one was assisted by wings. So this leopard was very fast. If you look how quickly um, Alexander the Great defeated the world empire, that by the age of 28 he had defeated it. it the, it's incredible that God has shown you that there's going to be this world empire under this person, Alexander the Great, and in a very short time he's going to defeat the world. And that's what he did. And so the leopard ties in so well to the nature of Alexander the Great and what happened with the Grecian Empire. Then the fourth empire, uh, the fourth beast, it says was a beast more terrible. And so this beast, part of it has come to pass yet. So part of it is the Roman Empire we looked at that's already taken place. But part of this beast has not yet taken place. And so it talks about the little horn coming up from the ten horns. And so that little horn, if you're looking down the statue, that little horn on the beast aligns to the toes of clay and whatever it was, sand, on this side. And it's referring to the same time frame, that at that time in history, there's coming this person, this little horn called the Antichrist, and he's going to set up his last earthly kingdom. It also talks about the ten horns. So again, those are ten kings that are going to join this, this, the Antichrist and what he's doing. And then three of those are going to rebel against him. And then I think that's probably enough for today. But it's just interesting that if you read the book of Daniel, he actually gives you some characteristics of this, this person that hasn't come yet, this kingdom that's still to come. Because he says here, this little horn had eyes like the eyes of a human being. And he had a mouth that spoke boastfully. So chances are this person might have striking eyes and it could be a great orator. This is someone who's going to, you know, wow people with their speech. Not only that, but as you read the book of Daniel, it says that this person doesn't serve the God of his fathers and that he's got no regard for women. And so God has given so much information about this future kingdom that's going to come in his Bible. And so I just want to give God the glory that there's so much information if we just take time to study it and know where to look for it. The amazing thing is that all the, all the four nations, so we've had the Babylonian Empire, the Medes and the Persians, we've had the Greeks, the Grecian Empire, and we've had the Roman Empire. All of those today have influenced the world that you and I live in. So the Babylonians, they were really responsible for paganism, magicians, astrology, sorcery, and false religion. And so we see that prevalent today. That's what Babylon consisted of. And so we see that in our world today. The Medes and the Persians... They were really known for their perversion, for the lust of the flesh, for immorality. And we see that in our world today more than ever. The Grecians, they were known for intellectualism and humanism. And we see that, again, in our world today, you just look around, you know. We don't need the Lord, we can do it in ourselves. And then the Romans, they gave us language and the alphabet and democracy and government. And we see that in our world today. And actually, I think on one of the dollar bills of the U.S., there's actually some stuff from the Roman Empire or Caesars on it. And so all these empires that God foretold through these dreams, you and I are influenced by them of what they've left behind. And so, the, you know, this is, um, so just to summarize, so God showed Daniel all the world empires. He showed them the order in which they would come in history. And I said to you last week or a few weeks before that the, the description in the Bible is so accurate, people don't believe it was prophetic. A lot of people believe it was written after the case because it's so accurate about what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, who's going to defeat who, who's going to marry who. But if you read the book of Daniel, you know, it's so accurate. So God foretold that before it happened. The amazing thing is God showed us the nature of all the people and all those empires. And you can see it in the, in the beasts that we've discussed and what it is. God's shown us a time when there's a future kingdom coming which hasn't come yet and it he said that in the time of that Antichrist, that Jesus will come back. And I mean, we know the Bible says Jesus come back. We know he said he's going to prepare a place for us that he'll come back. And so even though we don't know the date and the time, we know Jesus is coming back. And the last thing we see in the dream is that Jesus is going to set up his earthly kingdom. And as you read the book of Revelation, you read these prophetic books, you know, there is coming a time when Jesus is going to set up an earthly reign on this earth for a thousand years where the enemy is locked up. And I mean, that's out of the book of Revelations. And so we have so much information in this book, the Bible. And so I just want to give God the glory. And I just want to honor God that, you know, he's made it available to you and to us. So we know 
where we are. We know what's happening in history. And so I'm hoping that came through as clearly as I hoped. When I was preparing it, I hoped it, I was trying to prepare it in a way that it was clear. And then as I was talking through it, I suddenly realized maybe it's not as clear as I thought. But if you have any, thank you. But if you have any questions or if I've raised more doubts or if I've confused you more than you were when you came to church, please forgive me. Come and ask me afterwards and I can try and clarify. Otherwise, I'll point you to Jaden. Um, so, yeah, no, so really, so if you've got any, if you've got any questions, just, just let me know. <laughs> Shall we just close in prayer? So, Father, I want to thank you, Lord, that you're a good God. I thank you, Father, that as we take time to study your word, as we take time to understand your word, as we take time to ask questions, Lord, that you've put so much information in there. Father, you, you haven't left us in the dark. You've made it clear. You've shown us. You've told us you're coming back. You've told us the nations and the empires, Lord, when they're coming, the nature of each. And so, Father, I thank you, Lord, that you care not only about the nations, but about each and every one of us, Father. And you know our nature. You know our concerns. You know the things we go through. You know all those things. And so, Father, I want to thank you for just giving us so much information in your word. Help us to learn, help us to digest, help us to get hungry for more of you, hungry for more of your word. And Lord, don't let us ever get satisfied with just enough. Let us want more of you, Jesus. And so Father, I just pray, be with us this week, with every person. Lord, I pray your blood over every person, your protection over everyone. Just keep us safe this week. Let us have a good week. And we just want to give you all the glory and all the honor this morning, Jesus. Amen.